All right, with me here, as promised, in the hood, Peter Lee, the head of Microsoft Research. He is going to explain why Microsoft invests so much in research and why collaboration with the academic research community is so vital in these efforts. And in case, by the way, you've forgotten, you can still submit questions to Peter, for Peter. Just use the tool right there on your viewer. We'll keep scanning here. Peter, welcome, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. We're going to put research in focus officially here. Uh, I got to say, you, caught, you got to kick things off this morning. You came out on stage and you were talking a little bit about the overall experience of your job and, and, and as researchers and you used, I wrote it down at the time, that it's exhilarating and terror was the other <laughs> word you used. And I thought that would seem like a pretty, per sort of like being a parent. <laughs> it's the most exhilarating thing in my life and I'm always panic stricken. It, that's a great analogy. I've been using the analogy of riding a roller coaster. Yeah. You know, it's something that you just really want to do. You want to be in the middle of things. You want to have the great experience. It's fun. Yeah. It's joyful, um, but it's a little bit scary also. And I think in this past year, uh, Microsoft Research has been put in the position of getting to ride the roller coaster. You know, Let's talk about it from your, from your seat in the coaster. You've been the head of Microsoft Research for a year now. What's it been like? You know, um, first thing is every day when I walk into uh, any of our labs, I, it's this wonderful feeling you are stepping into the future. You, know, you see things around you. Mm -hmm and you know there's this inevitability that the things you're seeing, well, pretty soon the whole world is going to see this stuff in three right. or four or five or 10 years. You never know exactly when, but you know it's going to happen. And so every day it just feels like I'm stepping into the future. Yeah. And it, it just is so wonderful and incredible. At the same time, there's always pressure. We want to get this stuff out. Sure. And, um, and that's where this exhilaration comes in. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we're competitive, we want to win, uh, we want to do good things for the world and for society. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this combination of this just thrill of living in yeah. the future, but also the drive to push right. things out into the world. And as you admitted, the terror of needing to deliver, right? <laughs> you know, when you finally get to be big enough and tall enough to get on that roller coaster, yeah. and then you get strapped into the seat, That's right. and you're just the happiest person you could possibly be, um, and then you take off, then you do have sometimes a little shred of a <laughs> sure. thought, what have I gotten myself into? Yeah. Um, but yeah. it's the greatest thing in the world. Yeah, and it, this might be tough to answer, but what has surprised you the most over the last year? You know, I think maybe there are two things I would speak to, one on the technical side and one on the business side. On the technical side, the kind of continuing rapid advance in deep neural nets or deep learning um, has really shocked me. You know, it was one thing when uh, we saw these surprising advances in deep neural nets to enable speech recognition to really work in a practical way and get deployed into all of our services. Uh, but now, you know, it's not just speech recognition. It's computer vision. You know, uh, Harry Shum yeah. demonstrated this morning uh, this crazy dog breed app. It's just one of countless possibilities there. Uh, Similarly, we had a session this morning in the summit on deep neural nets to get deep understanding of text, of human discourse. Right. And it, there was just no inkling, even two or three years ago, uh, that we would get this far this fast. And um, I've been pretty surprised. Uh, more on the business side, uh, it was a surprise to me that Satya gave us such a big vote of confidence and mm -hmm. said, we will put a product out that will eliminate the language barrier through Skype worldwide. Right. Uh, that's just a dream that we've lived with, I think, for two decades. And now to say suddenly, I believe in what you guys are working on, we're going to put it out there for the world, and we're going to do it this year. Um, I was surprised, very pleasantly yeah. surprised. By the way, you get bravery points for opening the show this morning with what, uh, on many levels, certainly in, since we're doing a, a, a television version of the summit this year, we're, we're streaming this live, in entertainment and in show business, they always say never work with children or animals just because they're too unpredictable. And so you actually crossed that barrier this morning. You brought dogs out. For folks who missed it, you guys were sort of doing a demo of Cortana and brought dogs out, asked them what breed, right. asked her what breed these dogs were. She asked for a photo. You took some, identified them. Right. Uh, it, was, it was really fascinating stuff. You know, um, and that speaks to the terror because uh, yeah, right. this is really on the bleeding edge. Um, and if you remember the, the uh, person doing the demonstration, uh, Johnson Apicibwe, yeah. 
he then turned Cortana onto my boss, Harry Shaw, yes. to see what kind of dog he is. Uh, yeah. And um, and of course, Cortana nailed it and said that replied perfectly. I believe he is not a terrier. <laughs> And it, and it had the dog with the line through it symbol, the universal, right. this is not a dog. Right. Yeah. Now, you know, there's some frivolity, of, obviously, in uh, dog breeds. But, you know, what we're on the verge of being able to do is really give eyes to right. Cortana. Right. And so imagine what we can do if we can tell you, um, is that spider poisonous or not? Right. Or right. Uh, what did Wine Spectator think about that wine? Or sure. tell me about the nutritional content on this plate of food I've just been given. Or Gee, I like that jacket. Where can I get one like that That's, at the best yeah. price? Yeah, sure. The kinds of things that a future digital assistant might be able to do if endowed with the gift of sight sure. uh, are just limitless. And so we're really, really going after that. Now, we've heard today about the impact that Microsoft Research is having on the company. Uh, would you say there is a renewed emphasis on making contributions to Microsoft's product? Well, you know, we've always been very, very focused on product impact. In fact, every product in Microsoft has some imprint of Microsoft research contributions and technologies. The way I think about it is, um, you know, we have to embrace diversity. And so I have always preached this quadrant model mm -hmm. of research investments. Um, if you think about uh, two dimensions, uh, time scales, so we have our short-term research investments, mm -hmm things that only make sense if we get a quick payoff. Oh, in fact, I see we have a graph. That's it. And so you see on the x-axis, we have short-term to long-term investments. Sure. And then on the y-axis, we have choices of problems. And so we have our reactive problems. These are problems that product teams come to us saying, gee, we've really hit a brick wall. Can you help us? Or sometimes society comes to us with problems. A hospital might say, you know, we're really having a problem with uh, patients being discharged uh, after being treated for just of heart failure, they're being readmitted in three months. Can you help us figure this out? Mm -hmm. And then as you move up that y-axis, we get into the more open-ended search for truth and beauty. Mm -hmm. And so what we try to do in Microsoft Research is cover this entire space. We don't want to leave any stone unturned. And in fact, we cut the space into four quadrants that you can see here in this graphic. There you go. And so in this lower left corner, that's our product focus. That's where we embed our researchers with our product teams and just go after building the best products and services we can. On the lower right, the sustaining quadrant, that's where we work with our product teams to keep us at the bleeding edge. We want to have everything we do being at the cutting edge, being the best possible experience, best possible value for our customers. But then we have these upper quadrants, the upper right quadrant, our blue sky quadrant. This is open-ended, blue sky, push the frontiers of knowledge, see what's out there, mm -hmm. see what's beyond the headlights. And it's incredibly important that Microsoft Research does this because ultimately the product teams are going to be very focused on meeting the needs of the customers today. Mm -hmm. Someone has to be thinking about where is the customer going to be two years, five years, 10 years from now. And right. that blue sky quadrant is that. And then what has gotten a lot of attention lately is the upper left quadrant. And this is what Harry Shum has been calling the search for the next big thing. Disruptive. Based on what the world is today, what can we do that shocks the world? Right. That upends markets, that you know, catches our competition unaware. <laughs> you know, th those sorts of things. Um, things that change what people imagine is possible with technology. What if we can eliminate the language barrier? Right. What kind of world would that be? That's in this right. quadrant. And so if there's any renewed emphasis, I think it's on this upper left quadrant, you know, where we're really going for kind of the things that cause people to wake up in a different world a world where new possibilities exist. Uh, so we also heard earlier today from Harry Shum about some big research bets that Microsoft Research has made, a catapult. Uh, you know, can you talk about some of that stuff, quantum, just to name a few? Uh, how are these projects, for lack of a better term, being green-lighted? Uh -huh. you know? <laughs> well, you know, one of the fundamental uh, foundations of the philosophy of um, Microsoft Research is that we're a very bottoms of organization. Right. And so we really ask our researchers to integrate with the worldwide research community and universities, really on every continent, be fully aware of the best ideas that are emerging and bring those ideas into 
Microsoft. And in fact, about 80% of the research we do is done in collaboration with academic researchers. That's one reason why this faculty sure. summit is so important to us. It really helps us engage and in fact give back uh, to the research community because they give so much to us. And so one way to think about it is to think of a venture capital model. In Microsoft Research, I provide the Series A funding for all of our researchers. They can seed efforts that they think are important based on their interactions with their colleagues here in Microsoft and Microsoft Research, as well as their academic colleagues. And then if there's someone who has a spark of insight that something's really important, mm -hmm. so you mentioned Project Catapult. You know, Doug Berger is working on reconfigurable computing fabrics with academic researchers. Mm -hmm and then is encountering the end of Moore's law approaching and what that means to our data center operations. Mm -hmm. And he puts two and two together and says, oh my God, there's something big that we have to address here. And with that spark of insight, he's able in Microsoft Research to kind of go after a project like Catapult to see if reconfigurable fabrics can make a big difference in the data center. Wow. And if he's able to do that, that happens really completely without my intervention or input. There's no approval or green lighting that I, as head of Microsoft Research, have to do. Of course, there might come a time then when he's convinced hmm. that the company has to go big here. Right. That we have to deploy thousands of Catapult servers for Bing. And in that point, that's where I come in to help negotiate and broker and make decisions on what you would call a Series B level funding. Okay. and bring that either to our customers or to our internal operations. And so the magic, I think, of Microsoft Research is that our researchers, uh, we say our researchers have the freedom to pursue what they think is important, mm -hmm. um, but from a management perspective, it's magic because we're just getting this amazing percolation of Series A-level sure. startup ideas just brewing uh, yeah. constantly. Well, you mentioned that walking into work every day to you, it's this like walking into the future. I mean, yep. you're truly walking into this world of innovation. Uh, but with that, obviously comes a, a, a many layers, I'm sure, uh, of stress. And for you personally, what keeps you up at night? I mean, we all have stress nightmares. And, you know, for me, it's something like a microphone going out. and <laughs> The microphone won't work. And then you wake up. What keeps you up at night? You know, um, uh, I... I have to say, not much keeps me up because one thing about this place is there's always the luxury of no matter you know, just how crazy things seem to be, there seems to be this just inexhaustible supply of mm -hmm. great people and great ideas. It, it's something that I have learned to just count on. And in fact, one of the important lessons I've learned in my time in Microsoft Research is that you can almost never go wrong betting on a person who has an idea and passion, no matter what you think of the idea. In fact, back in 2009, when the first ideas to use deep learning in a serious way for speech processing came out, I thought it was the craziest idea. In fact, I, I thought it was <laughs> stupid. <laughs> But when you look at the passion of the people and their track records right. and just put your faith in that, pretty consistently great things happen. Now, having said that, um, of course, things do worry me all the time. You know, we have to deliver a great experience for Skype Translator. Now, that's something I think that's going to make a real impact on people's lives around the world, and we want to do right uh, by all of those users. Mm -hmm. And so, I worry and fret over and want to be a perfectionist on the quality of that experience. Sure. And in all of these things, when we deploy Catapult uh, throughout all of our data centers, this will have a direct impact on how good Bing is. We want to deliver on that. Uh, and uh, when we are working with our Xbox partners, they're just fantastic people to collaborate with. Um, they have Christmas shipping deadlines. Uh, yeah. We have to meet those deadlines with them. Yeah. And so those things always add certain stressors, but you know, I prefer to use exhilaration again. It's like sure. riding a roller coaster. Um, you know, would I rather not have those stresses? Uh, sure. Absolutely not, I, I want that. Yeah, well speaking of deadlines, we're just about out of time here. Uh, any final thoughts on what's happening here and all the folks watching from around the globe? Well, uh, one thing to emphasize is um, just what a huge deal it is for us to have this great relationship 
with academic researchers in the US, in Europe, in South America, in Asia. It's something that just dramatically magnifies what Microsoft Research and Microsoft are able to do. Um, the kind of enthusiastic response we get here is just tremendous for us. In fact, in these demos, almost all of the audience members here are great academic researchers from all the top universities. So we're learning just as much as they are through all of this. And so I just, yeah. I'm, just feel privileged and really thankful that they're yeah. all here. Well, we appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Fascinating, informative look at the, the role of research here at Microsoft. We appreciate your time here today as well. Thank you. It's been Thanks uh, for hanging out with chat. us.